Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, good morning for people who are based in East Asia and good afternoon for people coming from Hawaii and maybe perhaps good evening for people who are further beyond. And welcome to our uh, today's book launch. Uh, I am Herming Xiao. I'm the Director of Research Institute for the Humanity and Social Science on the National Science and Technology Council uh, in Taiwan. And today we have the pleasure to have a book event, a launch event for Dr. Zhang Yi Ling's new book. The book is called Xue Shen. Uh, let me introduce uh, the author and then our four panelists. Uh, Dr. Zhang Yi Ling uh, received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and her research specialty including family, uh, education and Chinese societies. She is currently affiliated with National Zhengzhou University in Taiwan. And in her book, she uh, analyzed the priv how Chinese privileged youth uh, struggle and compete through education. And she done she has done extensive field work for this study. And the book has reached uh, implication for sociology and education, and with a, a global attention to a rising Chinese power, I think her book has wider implication for for the beyond. And we today we also have a a a, a group of four panelists who will discuss uh, after uh, Dr. Jiang Yiling's uh, twenty minutes presentation on her book, and. Each pre each discussion will have for uh, ten to ten to thirty minutes for discussion. And let me introduce uh, for for discussion. The first one is Dr. Xu Doto. She is affiliated with uh, Hong Kong University right now. And the second discussion will be uh, Dr. Li Anglan. Uh, he is working with uh, NYU Shanghai right now. And the third speaker will be uh, Dr. Lin Le. He is coming from University of Hawaii, and our last discussion is Dr. Lin Zhonghong. He's affiliated with Academica Sinica Taiwan, and Dr. Lin Zhonghong is also among our executive board member. So after after four four speakers, we'll have a Q and A section, and our audience are encouraged to. Uh, we 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 later will show a slide. Uh, address so people can put your question there. Either the question can be put either in, in in English or in Chinese. I think we are both fine with that. And maybe we, uh, if if audience are, are waiting, then we can maybe allow people to ask the question directly. And then the whole section uh, uh, is scheduled to uh, last for 90 minutes. But since we have a lot of crowded panels, maybe we will extend the, the whole event uh, for 10 to. 20 minutes. So without further ado, uh, thank you again for, for joining us with today's uh, online book launch. So the time will uh, give the floor to Dr. Jiang Yiling. So over to you, Yiling. Uh, Yiling, you have to unmute yourself. Um, thank you, Hela Shi, for the introduction. Um, thank the panelists for coming, and thank you all for joining. I am delighted to share my book with you. I will provide a short summary, and without revealing too much detail, I hope that this book would be of interest to you all. Um, study Gods is a longitudinal ethnographic study about the lives of elite youth who come from China. It is about how they prepare for college, how they go through everyday life, how they interact with everyone around them. But most importantly, it is about how these young people learn to compete for status against their peers around the world. I show that while to the outsider, these students seem to be exclusively preparing for the Gaokao and American college applications, they are in fact acquiring and polishing the skills that will help them navigate adulthood around the world. To understand students' daily life and observe their interactions, I moved to Beijing and followed 28 affluent students in top-ranked high schools. I went to school with them. I shared their schedules. We sat through courses together. So if the student had a 15-hour school day, I also had a 15-hour ethnographic day. For some, I also shadowed, shadowed them at home. If they worked for the whole afternoon, 
on Sunday, for example, then I would also be in the same room and doing the same thing as well for the entire afternoon. Through these activities, I got to know their teachers, their parents, in addition to themselves, um, and I interviewed the teachers and parents as well. I continued to do annual visits with these students for uh, seven years, between 2012 and then all the way until 2019. Uh, in 2019, these students were no longer students, but they were in graduate school or working in various countries. And so with these research activities in study gods, I show that students learn three lessons in high school. First, they must understand the structure of the status system. This means that they need to know which personal characteristics are valued and hopefully acquire these, these uh, characteristics, while they also must refrain from showing the characteristics that are not of value. Second, they need to play by the rules of the game. They need to learn what behaviors are considered appropriate depending on the status group that they themselves are in. And also they need to apply this to daily life in interactions with their peers, their teachers, as well as their parents. Third and lastly, they must prepare backup plans so that should they slip or make a mistake, they will not fall from grace or glory, but instead would be able to get back on their feet and stay inside the competition. Simply put, the status system I observed across high schools is one that primarily rested on the importance of test scores. Students with high test scores have high status in school, and those who score below the school average have low status. However, in top high schools, many students have exceptionally high test scores, and sometimes the averages for an exam would be the full score. Since it is unlikely for that many students to have high status within a status system, as a result, students issued a secondary criterion to subdivide the high and low status groups. This criterion is what I call demonstrated ease, which is a quantified measure of an individual's time spent on activities unrelated to college preparation. These activities would include online gaming, doing sports, but also simply eating and sleeping. Using test scores and then ease, the students across schools constructed a status system that consisted of four groups. The study gods, Xue Shen, on the top, who don't work too hard, but whose test scores are very high. And then just beneath them are study holics, Xue Ba, which refers to students who work very hard and have test, very high test scores as well. It should be noted that study gods and study holics have comparable test scores and usually go to the same colleges. Both have high status in school, but the study gods are more admired by peers for their demonstration of ease. The low status group include underachievers, Xue Jia, and losers, Xue Ruo. Underachievers are students who don't work hard and don't have high test scores. Losers are students who study very hard, but still get low test scores. These group boundaries are maintained on a daily basis. Students admire the high status students and talk favorably about them. They also mock or ridicule the low status students. Such a status, uh, status system is meaningful and it carries important consequences for the students because this data system helps elite students make sense of the world around them. While some would possibly think that the world of elite teenagers is not nearly the same as you know, the harsh, cold real reality of the adult world, the two are in fact pretty much connected. Equating test scores with money, elite youth recognize the importance of both education and money in determining future, future social economic status. And don't most of us who are part of the so-called adult world live in societies where social economic outcomes are indeed measured by education, income, or wealth. Micro interactions in daily life provide important foundations for observed macro social phenomenon. And so to fully understand the importance of such a status system, 
I also examine how it is constructed, maintained, and justified by focusing on students' daily interactions with peers, teachers, and their parents. Here again, state has played a decisive role in shaping these relations, and in turn, it was sustained. Study gods and study holics enjoyed peer aberration, while underachievers and losers seemed to do nothing right in the eyes of their schoolmates. The students who were uh, of high status dealt with teachers going so far as so-called hanging teachers on the blackboard, while students with low status typically follow teachers' instructions. Even at home, parents pampered the high performers while they kept a close watch over the activities of their low performing children. The result was that interactions at home closely paralleled those in school as study gods and study holics handled their parents, but underachievers and losers had to obey parents' orders. Parents play another important role, which is to help their children prepare for unforeseen setbacks. Students could very well fail important tests, or even they could fail the gaokao. They could make mistakes, and that probably would have set them back if it were not corrected. It is in these moments or these situations that the otherwise hands-off elite parents would rush to their children's assistance. Unsurprisingly, with the resource, knowledge, and information that these parents hold, they are largely successful in mitigating the setback that their children has perhaps uh, experienced. The world that elite youth perceive through the lens of their status system is not limited to the youthful ages of adolescence, nor is it confined within national borders. Coleman famously called the teenagers' world as the adolescent society. Murray Milner saw adolescent status hierarchy as a unique phase in life that focused exclusively on status and prestige. But however, by contrast to these famous and wonderful literature, the students whom I followed in Beijing, in fact, faithfully applied the lessons and the status that they learned in high school to college, graduate school, and at work. They sorted peers based on college GPA and later their colleagues by job performance, which is oftentimes measured as the amount of revenue brought to a company or the income that one makes. These students learn to deal with their supervisors as if they were their teachers, believing that employees who brought high revenue to the company were appreciated more than those that, who did not. They also made backup plans by seeing their parents as example. And thus, the setbacks they later experienced from, for example, failing core courses in college to not landing their dream jobs afterwards, um, these setbacks did not set them back. Indeed, they applied the skills um, they learned in high school and went on to earning top income in various parts of the world, from the United States and the United Kingdom to Singapore and Hong Kong. In other words, the SEDA system that they constructed in Beijing high schools became somewhat of a roadmap with which they successfully navigated global and adult society. Fundamentally, Study Gods is a story about status reproduction. Social inequality is often sustained and reproduced in unobserved ways, using seven years of ethnography and follow-up visits, as well as over 100, 100 interviews. Study Gods, this book, reveals that elite status reproduction now takes place not within individual countries, but at a global scale. By recognizing and practicing the rules of status attainment, the new generation of elites from China have been groomed for global competition. It is in this sense that the elite students in the study have been prepared to embark on their quest for elite status around the world. Um, this is my summary, thank you. Oh, it's very short. Uh, it's a very succinct uh, summary of the new book. Uh, thank you so much. So it says, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Zhang Yin really saved a lot of time for us for to discuss her book. 
So next up will be our panelists. So the first one will be Dr. Xu Duo Duo. Now over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ho. And uh, let me share my screen first. So can you see my screen now? Is that okay? Okay, great. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank Eileen for uh, uh, inviting me to this book launch and more importantly, for giving me the opportunity to read her fascinating book, Jishin Study Guides. Um, and while I was reading the book, of course, I immediately recalled uh, uh, Annette Flora's famous book, Unequal Childhoods. Uh, but I also uh, kept thinking about some TV shows that I had watched over the years, like Xiao Bie Li. Uh, it's a Chinese TV show which features three different Chinese families in Beijing, and the parents have to uh, accept the separation from their child for the sake of better education abroad. And also a Korean uh, show, uh, Sky Castle, um, which describes how uh, middle class or affluent families use every means possible to, to ensure their children to uh, uh, be admitted into the top three uh, universities in South uh, Korea. And finally, Gossip Girl. <laughs> so it is an American uh, teen drama which reveals the uh, luxury lives of several privileged upper class adolescents living in uh, Upper East, uh, Manhattan's Upper East. So I think a common feature um, highlighted in these TV shows uh, and also in Eileen's book is the extreme emphasis on uh, academic success and also educational elitism among those well-off families. Um, and that's why I think in a way, uh, Eileen's research provides a very comprehensive description and also a sociological uh, explanation for this important uh, phenomenon that uh, exists not only in China, but also around uh, the globe. Uh, and uh, although there's apparently a lot to like about this paper, uh, about this book, um, uh, here I can only list a few things that I have uh, that have intrigued me the most, uh, as well as well as surprised me most and puzzled me most. Um, but first and foremost, I believe uh, the greatest merit and strength of this uh, study is its longitudinal nature. So, as a quantitative researcher. I'm fully aware of the difficulty in and also the value of collecting longitudinal survey data. So I can only imagine how hard it was to track 28 ambitious and maybe sensitive teenagers for seven years and across the borders. So for people who study uh, a child and youth development, including myself, you will you will see people change so much from uh, childhood to adulthood, and almost all the important life-changing events, um, including getting a degree, uh, finding a first job, marrying someone, and, and having a baby, all these life-changing events happen during this transitional period. So this actually reminds me of uh, the famous documentary films produced by BBC, uh, the Up series. I don't know if people have watched this before, so uh, in this documentary uh, uh, series, they interviewed uh, several seven-year-olds from different social class backgrounds uh, um, and follow them every seven years until these children reach the age of 63. And I think much like the UP series, the study guides uh, not only uh, vividly shows the life trajectories of those blessed young people, but also clearly demonstrates the persistence of social advantage and also the reproduction of inequalities through education system uh, in China. And uh, even more valuable is that uh, it actually managed to continuously follow them as they crossed the national borders. Um, uh, and then they studied, worked, and lived uh, in uh, like US, Europe, and elsewhere. So this is of crucial importance uh, because we know from previous uh, uh, migration literature that high skill or high quality uh, workers tend to be movers. 
uh, they actively chase for better life and also better career opportunities around the globe. So Ealing's observations actually verify that uh, international mobility is also a major uh, characteristic of this new generation of uh, global elites from China. And uh, another reason that I think people will find this book so intriguing is that um, it focuses on the upper middle class in a supposed to be classless uh, socialist society. Uh, we know that um, most of the concepts and theories about uh, class stratification were typically based on modern Western uh, capitalist societies. Uh, of course, first Europe and then uh, United States. Therefore, um, sociologists have always been very keen to understand the difference uh, uh, or differences in the class system of socialist and capitalist countries. And I think with the rise of China in recent decades, economically and uh, politically, uh, increasing academic uh, attention and public attention has been paid to uh, the so-called class inequalities and also social stratification in general within this country. So against this backdrop, I think Ealing's research actually offers a glimpse into the process of uh, educational attainment and also status reproduction uh, among Chinese elite families. So uh, there are also a few findings from Ealing's study that really surprised me. Uh, one thing is that uh, contrary to our imagination, those elite students, uh, no, matter, uh, no matter their uh, uh, 学生 or 学霸, they actually study very hard at school. Uh, they may try to pretend that they're not spending much effort in uh, achieving a good grade uh, so that they can be worshipped by their uh, uh, peers. But instead, they care so much about their test scores because they know from heart that uh, those are the tickets to top universities and subsequently uh, to elite status. Uh, another really, really interesting observation that contradicts with the, our stereotype is that middle class parents, especially East Asian middle class parents, uh, tend to be very aggressive in uh, intervening in their children's education. Uh, this so-called helicopter parents, right, uh, who try to uh, control uh, every aspect of their children's uh, school life and personal life. However, uh, during Ealing's field study, uh, she found that elite parents actually were quite laid back and quite hands off uh, in terms of their uh, children's um, educational uh, uh, experience. They seldom contacted uh, teachers at schools, and they only provide assistance and guidance to their children when necessary. Um, and because of this autonomy and also freedom parents gave to their children, these children tend to develop, I think, a sense of deservingness. Um, uh, they think that I can enter the top university and find a high paying job, uh, because mainly because I deserve it, I earned it. Uh, and Ha, uh, have nothing to do with, with my privileged uh, family background. Um, so to me, um, I think having such parents um, is much like having a really nice car. Uh, the children feel like they're in charge of their own lives uh, because they're the ones who's driving the car. Uh, therefore, when they, uh, they uh, of course, they can uh, decide where to go, uh, which roads to take, uh, when to pull over and how how fast they drive. Uh, so when they finally arrive at the destination, they were proud to take the credits. They feel like they earned it on their own. Um, however, they often neglected the fact that they couldn't have made it or they couldn't have made it so easily without the help and protection of the car. Um, so as sociologists always say, uh, privilege is invisible to those who have it. Um, and finally, there are uh, things from the book that I found a little bit puzzling to me. Uh, maybe Elin can help to uh, address some of these questions during the Q&A session. So one thing is that uh, 
uh, a wide academic success is still of utmost importance to these elite students uh, when their adv uh, advantageous family backgrounds could clearly have offered them more life options. Um, uh, another question is, um, so you mentioned that you define students from families with income in the like top 10 percent in the country as elite. And you also mentioned that in your sample, two thirds of the families were affiliated with the military or work uh, in the government. Uh, so I can't help to wonder the possible uh, heterogeneity within this elite group. Uh, more specifically, do you spot any difference between those uh, Guan Ar Dai and Fu Ar Dai, so children of political elites and children of economic elites, uh, in terms of their status reproduction process. Uh, because I was told that in recent years, children of high ranking cadres in China often pursue a career in the market sector instead of the state sector, and particularly in finance, probably because their advantageous family backgrounds can provide them with some sorts of connections or information uh, that may help them to generate enormous personal wealth rapidly. So I wonder, is this suspicion consistent with your observations during the field study? And uh, finally, I also wonder, beyond high school, um, how can these children remain uh, innately superior uh, uh, and occupy the center of attention in those overseas universities where test scores are clearly not the solely important uh, measure to evaluate a student's uh, uh, competency. Um, and these are my questions. Uh, so last but not, not least, I must say that I very much enjoyed reading the book. I highly, highly recommend it to anyone who is interested in understanding this new uh, elite generation in China. And I want to congratulate Eileen on her fast, uh, fantastic achievement. And I, 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 I'm truly happy for you. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shizuo. Um, I think it's really a nice comment to bring out the, uh, uh, her to put her finding in the context of social stratification in current Chinese right now. Chinese society right now it is always difficult for us sociologists to study up. Uh, so it leaves open, oftentimes an opaque word to us for the reason, simple reason that we didn't originate from that sector. Now I think eating has uh, made a significant uh, discovery. I think I think more more um, to be discussed in the following. So the next up, uh, we'll invite uh, Dr. Li Anglan uh, for to share his soul with us. Now over to you, Dr. Li. Okay. Uh, can you can you hear me? Okay, uh, so uh, thank you for the invitation from Eileen. And this is a really fantastic uh, fantastic and awesome research. Uh, this actually uh, reminds me the last time uh, we met each other back in 2019, that's before pandemic, right? So we, we met in the New York City for the ESA and then we talk about this project and at the time you, you were gonna meet the editor and the publisher, right? So to talk about this project, you know, since this, you know, Three years pass, and I see this this book in print. And, you know, I'm truly happy for you, and uh, all this eight years, more than eight years of work, you know, actually uh, came into life. And also, this this book actually, I read about this book and I learned a lot. And this today, I actually uh, want to share some of the comments, but it's not a comments; it's just my uh, thoughts that I want to share with the audience after I read this book. I gave a little bit of title on, on on this on this comments. I'm gonna talk about the field and structure and the regime, and elite production and the reproduction. And first, we're going to talk about um, the field, right? So as a sociologist of education and who studies uh, social stratification and mobility, we know um, there's a tons of literature folks on how schools and families and the workplace uh, reproduce or produce different kinds of inequalities across um, the, the life course for children. And this is a, a, a really famous uh, book that uh, uh, Doctors, you just mentioned about this and coach health host, right? You wish is actually focus on families a lot. And then within the sociology of education, uh, like my own, my, myself, I focus on schools, how schools reproduce uh, inequalities. 
But I think the, the, the striking contribution of Eileen's work is to look at this in a different field, which I call it the transnational field. You know, they follow the kids around uh, uh, almost like eight years, and then, you know, they travel from different countries, not only in China, but also expand these this borders to United States, UK, Hong Kong, and other different places around the world. And through, through this kind of angle, we, we kind of know this is a different class of people compared to we just study schools and families, the workplace, how they're gonna reproduce inequalities. So this is the first thing uh, I think this book, uh, it gotta be put on my reading list to actually uh, everybody who studies sociology of education should read about this because they actually open to a new window for us to look at inequalities through different angles. Uh, which is the transnational fields. But this is leading to a question is uh, how to study transnational fields when examining status competition, right? This is, uh, Ealing shows a really good example, um, but for me, it's more like a descriptive and interpretive way to study these fields, the transnational fields. But if we want to design a new study, how are we going to actually look at the causal impacts of the transnational fields and how to reproduce the different kinds of inequalities and how we're going to collect data for that? And this is something from, um, from my understanding because my own work focuses on uh, quantitative research, but, uh, but actually Eileen's work really set up an example for us. It has to be a longitudinal and it has to be a multinational con context to rethink this uh, status competition and how, gonna, how elites reproduce their status. So this is the field um, I wanna talk about. And the second is the structure um, which Eileen already talked about this ideal types, study gods, study holic, underachiever, and a loser. When I look at those, uh, I want to say labels, right? Those categories, I was thinking, which I, which I'm supposed to belong to you in this category, right? When I was in high school, compared to my own experiences, I always think, you know, I'm not definitely not a study gods, you know, I'm not a study holic. Um, I cannot be a, a loser category. I, I talked this with Eileen, and she doesn't actually agree with me, but. But this is actually, I kind of, this kind of ideal types is a, a, a really new kind of a concept for non-Chinese audience. They will follow this category to think about how we're going to navigate uh, the educational system in China to understand the impacts of the, those educational systems. But for the audience in China, I think people have a different understandings about this structure, right? And, and also people are really hesitant to to say that, oh, I belong to the category of a study gods. You know, if you talk about the students, oh, you're a study gods, they say, no, 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 I'm not a study gods. But this is actually uh, pushed me to think about how we're gonna actually um, uh, came up with new social categories and how this, you know, the meaning of the social categories interacting with the subjects that we're gonna study. And also in her book, she mentioned this, you know, how, how this kind of different reactions of the students um, when, when they think about themselves, you know, in, their, in terms of their test scores, right? And also so build in, their, uh, in their subconsciousness, you know, they, they haven't realized or they already become a study guys. But as a researcher, I will say that, you know, we need to think about how we're gonna construct a different ideal types to make sense of this structure. And also I think another uh, really important contribution uh, for her work is that within group heterogeneity, uh, just uh, like, uh, uh, Dr. Dodo, Shidodo just mentioned about this, right? And uh, for me, is is not a static heterogeneity within the group. It's a dynamic. Since you know, Eileen followed those students, you know, more than eight years, and you will see this dynamic trajectories for for different types of students. You know, even study girls become a different. Uh, they choose. They have a different decision. They make a different decisions within. You know, even though we we label them as a study girls, but uh, they they're facing different challenges with the actual intern uh, the workplace. So this is really important for, for me to think about how we're gonna study within group heterogeneity and in a more vivid and dynamic way. And the third one I think is the most interesting part is, um, is a merit-based sense of entitlement and constraint. This is, reminds me when I read about uh, LaRosse book and Coachellos, and she mentioned about a sense of entitlement and constraint, mostly based on social class uh, perspective. But in Eileen's book, I, I feel like it's, it's more about a merit, more about a testing score. It's a building in the system um, that everybody thinks, oh, you know, um, just like um, Dr. Shidodo just mentioned about a sense of a deservedness, a deservedness, right? So it, they, they deserve this, this treatment within school and within family because they are a top niche a student within, the, within school. And then it'll make me think about what are the underlying mechanisms 
that I can explain the hidden logic of status competition. You know, how this sense of entitlement and constraint based on merits has been, um, you know, produced and been reinforced uh, through different kinds of mechanisms. In this book, I mean, we, we definitely learn a lot through uh, peer interactions, interaction with teachers, and interaction with the parents. And those are the kind of the micro level mechanisms help us to understand the status competition. But I'm thinking maybe there are some kind of a, a, a muscle level uh, mechanisms that are working there, right, within the school system, you know, like uh, the policy or some other kind of arrangements within the school actually reinforce this, this logic of a status competition among students. So this is something that I think is really, really interesting that I, uh, when I read about this book, I, I, I think about, I constantly think about this, this structure, you know, how we're gonna actually study the structure uh, and through different contexts. And the last one is the regime, right? So uh, it's more about a macro level uh, factors, um, you know, throughout this book. And Elaine followed this case since from 2012. At the time, um, the word is completely a different word compared to right now, right? So uh, 2012 for me is, uh, is a really nice year, right? And still in the United States, still Obama's America. And still you see this globalization is, um, is on rising on the time. And we, we cherish the, the cosmopolitanism, you know, during the, you know, around 2012. And the meritocracy, you know, even a lot of scholars question the, the meaning and assumptions of meritocracy, but it's still that's the fundamental uh, kind of the values that are hold about the modern societies. But today, you know, after the pandemic, uh, things has changed a lot, especially we see this increasing trend of the Globalization. You know, if you think about the U.S.-China relationship, we see this decoupling is happening right now. And as somebody actually have thought about the cosmopolitanism, right? You know, whether we should actually still believe um, a truly uh, a global and a universal values across the humanity. So this is kind of a regime change, really pushed me to think about, you know, how how it actually going to impact the status competition among elites, because it creates a, a huge uncertainty. That's why I think Elise's book is, is particularly important in this context because she lay out on the stories that are prepared for us to understand in the future. So the question is, what are the implications of this macro level social changes for elite uh, reproduction? Especially you think about at the different historical times and different, you know, uh, the, the macro level social changes. So this is something that I think in the future uh, the, the more researchers can actually um, to look at this in, in a different angle. Um, so basically, I'm trying to argue this uh, is elite production or reproduction. So especially in China, I want to talk about the China a little bit more about here is if you look at different generations, um, the older generation and new generation, we compare the new elites and old elites within the contemporary Chinese society, we see a huge uh, variation the huge um, differences among different generations. And uh, I feel Elaine's book captured the generation that I'm mostly familiar with. The, the students that I, I taught with at Zhejiang University or NYU Shanghai, they're falling into the categories of you know, Elaine's uh, descriptions. But if their parents and their grandparents were, were no less about, about those generations, right? So if we can conduct a study to compare different generations, how the elite production you know, intertwined with so macro level social changes, we're gonna have a better understanding how the society has changed and how it means for elite uh, a reproduction of social inequalities in a general sense. And also for me, if you compare to uh, different generations, an elite reproduction or production not necessarily mean upward social mobility in China right now. And if you uh, actually read about the book, uh, the Elaine mentioned a lot about the, the anxiety and the struggles those elite students encounter into a different uh, context, especially in the United States, they're facing uh, racial segregation, uh, facing a bamboo selling, those kind of struggles actually not necessarily mean those elite reproduction ultimately gonna lead to upward social mobility, but still facing uh, uh, struggles for them. And this is something that I think is quite interesting um, to look at this, this book uh, and, you know, from the different angles, from different perspectives and from the micro level to the missile level to the micro level. And this book is definitely, uh, um, I'm gonna definitely put this book on my reading list and I'll ask my students to read about this book. And 
And it's, it's especially to, to think about the Chinese context and also uh, elite production in a global sense, right? Because you know, our world is changing so much and it will change in a different way that we, we don't know uh, in, in what direction, right? So this is definitely uh, a, a, a book that, uh, that actually help us to think about you know, how we're gonna study sociology of education, social stratification mobility. And thank you and uh, really wish this book to sell well in the future. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's my comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Yangnan. I, I think uh, you bring out very important theoretical threats, including uh, transnational field and changing political economy, and also a new pattern of elite reproduction. And on, on this basis, I think we can have further conversation with the authors. And the next up will be uh, Dr. Lin De from Hawaii. So the uh, floor is yours. Okay, uh, to illustrate the uh, importance of ease, I, I, I will not be using slides. Uh, and I've used my peer pressure to also talk uh, Elin out of using the slides. All right. Uh, so thanks, Elin, uh, Professor Ho, and uh, National Zhengzhou University for inviting me and organizing the book talk. It's a great honor to join you and uh, celebrate the publication of Study Gods. I'd like to first congratulate Elin for this uh, wonderful achievement uh, and share a short piece of my personal reading experience. I very much enjoyed reading the book and found it uh, rich, riveting, and subtle. The categorization of four types is highly relatable because as a, a former student of a public high school in a Chinese city, I can literally put most of my former classmates into these four types. I also feel that reading the book is like uh, revisiting my high school memories with a sociological lens. And this lens allows me to make new sense out of past events, such as teachers tolerating high performers, uh, peers and teachers publicly shaming low performance, and parents accommodating their kids. I will also recommend this book to my you know, schoolmates and friends to help them shake their existing assumptions and develop a more reflexive understanding of education, especially because some of them are still firm believers of innate ability. Now let me unpack some uh, substantive themes of the book and outline its major contributions. Uh, first, Study Gods moves beyond existing paradigms in sociology of education by highlighting a relational, interactional, and dynamic approach to status. We all know that status is inherently relational in the sense that it is based on the eyes of the beholders. So in Ilin's book, we see how the status of xue shen, xue ba, xue zha, xue ruo are constructed and reproduced in the kind of panoramic perceptions of peers, teachers, parents, and even you know, students themselves. Furthermore, this book illustrates the interactional and dynamic mutual construction between student status and university status. Of course, um, student and university status are based on perceptions and they are social constructs. But once codified and under certain culture, however, university ranking becomes a reality that assigns differential values to different students. And in return, students accepting and deifying the ranking system constitutes a powerful endorsement for the status of elite universities. As many examples in this book uh, reveal, Chinese students somewhat hierarchical and meritocratic interpretations of the global university ranking elevate the status game to a new high level. And the best example in this regard is the, the world map on the wall of Capitol High School in chapter one. And here we see, you know, even among the most prestigious, you know, US and British universities, Harvard enjoys a towering status in the eyes of Chinese educators and students as it is the only university whose name is written in the bold and larger font. And in contrast, Cambridge is only entitled to a larger but no bold font, and other universities have neither larger nor bold fonts. So when I showed this example to some of my US colleagues, they're all amazed by the level of categorical distinction and hierarchy 
Hmong universities in the eyes of Chinese educators and students, as well as how such perception might translate into you know, concrete actions of these social actors uh, and how some of their resources might you know, flow into these different universities. Second, study gods fills a gap in literature by depicting a social web in which the prevailing Chinese style meritocracy is embedded. To my knowledge, many existing studies on Chinese meritocracy has adopted a kind of state-centered approach on the historical evolution of China's bureaucracy and the Keju exam system. And recently, there has been a shift to give more attention to the kind of rituals and belief system of meritocracy. But so far, we still know very little about how everyday social interactions between teachers and students between parents and students, uh, between parents and educators, and uh, among students themselves, uh, how they sustain the meritocracy. And through Elaine's vivid stories, we see how meritocracy as an abstract cultural system is produced and reproduced in the social process of distinctions among the four student types. And it's, it is exactly because um, the Chinese students are so embedded in such a complex web of social interactions that they not only take meritocracy seriously, but also take the idea of innate uh, ability for granted. The third major contribution of this book lies in a weaving uh, micro, meso, and macro level uh, perspectives into a coherent study in sociology of education. Well, just by looking at the, the, the wide variety of concepts in this book, right, such as cultural capital, distinction, entitlement, uh, rule defiance and obedience, ease, uh, peer pressure, we can identify the legacy of peer, uh, you know, Boudier, uh, Laryl, Kahn, and Armstrong. And Elin's book makes significant contributions to these existing studies by uh, not only integrating so many micro and meso level concepts, but also you know, singling out two key dimensions to keep her model parsimonious. Moreover, this book develops the idea of ease and creatively combines it with another micro level Goffmanian perspective on strategic impression management. In this regard, this book vividly describes how some students only pretend to study hard while some others pretend to look relaxed when they were in fact making serious efforts. And this is because according to Elaine, a student's capacity to demonstrate ease and their skills to disguise themselves constitute a significant but often you know, neglected determinant for their status. Uh, in chapter three, for example, we see how Elaine, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the girls, right, Lily, her status could not be elevated since she made every effort to demonstrate ease, but her hardworking style was often exposed. So furthermore, this book connects these existing micro and meso level uh, perspectives with a more macro global perspective by demonstrating how Chinese elite students and their parents navigate the global education system. And interestingly, this micro macro link takes the form of uh, not only interacting with Western universities and counselors, but also weighing values of different options in the global status world, constructed by Chinese students and parents. Uh, finally, let me offer a very brief comment on the book's methodology. Uh, Study Gods showcase a model of ethnography. As a ethnographer myself, I'm very much impressed by the extent to which Elaine captured a wide range of fleeting moments Okay. In chapter three, for example, Ilin's description reconstructs not only verbal exchanges during students' every, everyday uh, interactions, but also the facial expressions, the uh, conversational turn takings, and even the power dynamics that is manifest in who is ignoring who in the conversation. And such examples, along with the, some previous examples I mentioned, like the, the font on the wall, show solid effort in note-taking, cross-checking, and interpreting. Uh, now, I have two questions for Ilin. Uh, so my first question concerns the Goffmanian approach to the idea of ease, right? 
Uh, with a few exceptions, such as uh, Lily, the girl, it seems that ease described in this book is highly strategic, manageable, and subject to free choice of students. So I'm wondering uh, if your conclusion might be different if you, you conceptualize ease as more determined by cultural script and less open to strategic use. So for example, is it possible that the, the hardworking image of many female students is actually bounded by the prevailing gender roles? And to what extent is ease largely also determined by academic performance? A related methodological question is, to what extent do you think that uh, your presence as an ethnography, ethnographer uh, may have facilitated or uh, promoted ease display as a strategic behavior? Uh, one last question. Uh, it has to do with the idea of status. We all know that status is a situational and a perception based. So different stakeholders might have different understandings about status in different situations. So in this sense, I'm wondering if um, the somewhat linear hierarchy from uh, Xue Shen to Xue Ruo uh, reflects only the views of a particular group in the uh, academic setting. So is there a way to measure or determine whether a different status system or a subculture held by a group of students, such as those talented in music and sports, uh, how do we de de determine that their culture is actually the peripheral culture? Is it possible that their culture can be mainstream in some other settings? Okay, thank you all. I wish you, uh, you know, all the success in the marketing and later stages uh, in the book. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ling. I think you wonderfully demonstrate that it is possible to deliver, engage, and penetrate in common with ease. That means without the use of a presentation file. So it's a very good demo for there. And the final speaker will be uh, Dr. Lin Zhonghong. He is from Academia Sinica. So Zhonghong, you have the floor. Hey, thank you. And I'm very, I really appreciate that, Ilin. Uh, I uh, asked me to be the discussant of this uh, new book uh, laundry uh, pa panel, and I really uh, uh, learn a lot and also uh, recommend this new book, uh, especially from ta Taiwanese <laughs> scholars perspective. I believe that this book could be a very good, um, um, a very good start point of the comparison of the East Asian credential system that can contribute more to the, not only for the Chinese scholars, but also for the, all the scholars in East Asia. And uh, uh, of course, you can also compare United States educational system and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the Chinese educational system. So it's very interesting uh, for, from the, in fact, from the comparative educational uh, viewpoint that can also have a lot of, you can learn a lot from that book. And I also want to um, uh, uh, talk about that by, because uh, in the last several days, I I reread it and also I'll write down my, some of my comments here. So I will show the, use the PowerPoint slides here. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay, I will talk about the merits and the implications of this uh, book because uh, I also, I'm not only study uh, uh, educational stratification, but also now I have a position in uh, the center of contemporary China in Taiwan, National Taiwan Tsinghua University. Um, uh, uh, so I, I think that this book also deserve more um, um, uh, discussions because uh, this is a very good book uh, also have some implications for uh, political sociology and uh, the other um, the other people that who care about China in, in the future so uh, I think that this is an excellent book new study of the formation of Chinese elites so uh, for lo those people who care about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, it is a decision making of the most important uh, people in China. They should look at the, the book and see the details of how they are formatted from the educational system. 
and uh, it is a good demonstration of educational inequality and its reproduction from the qualitative method and uh, micro-level observations. It have a very uh, uh, precise and a very concrete, very uh, um, uh, intense uh, 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 ethnographic uh, uh, data and a very good analysis. And it links the macro level social changes under China's economic reform and the micro level unequal trajectories of students, high school, those high school students in, in Beijing. And uh, especially I want to mention that this book could be put into the, uh, the context, especially like um, Professor Liang Ran has mentioned, it is in fact in the high time of the globalization and, uh, and the transition, market transition in China. So uh, this is give, this give us a very good um, a picture of how, how that could happen uh, in China, but it, now it, we, we have uh, over the high tide. So, <laughs> so it is a very interesting uh, moment that we can see how that historical moment can be kept in this book. And uh, uh, in the reform area, the importance of the human capital or cultural capital, uh, of course, it is sometimes related to uh, economic and uh, political capitals, uh, but not always reproduced from them. Uh, this is not in the in that uh, in that period becoming more and more in, important in the mobility regime in in China, and uh, 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 it's, it is also on the earth that in the area of globalization before the decoupling of the United States and China. So this is a very good. Uh, give us very good uh, uh, description and uh, ethnography of that moment that before the, the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, uh, and it also showed the, the internal momentum of the, the dynamics of the educational system that it can reproduce the inequality by itself. So, uh, it is a um, show the autonomous, autonomous uh, educational system that formed its own order and inequality that of, of social status. Like uh, uh, you have mentioned that uh, there was a, uh, uh, that being uh, the ideal type of the four uh, of the four degrees of uh, people that is, they are study gods, study holics, underachiever and loser, and. Uh, um, there are some implications that I have to mention from the reading of Yilin's book. Uh, uh, this especially, I, I love the very beautiful uh, section in the almost the, in the end of the book that she talked about the implications of her book. Um, uh, I think that in my words, I will say that the, the book showed the, the study gas convenient for the legitimacy that is a uh, 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 meritocracy or tyranny of the merit uh, of an unequal social system. Uh, and this is the uh, most uh, beautiful sentence that I think that in the whole book, but uh, because I can difficultly rewrite it. So I, I turn to quote it here of the Elian's, uh, her, her own sentence. Uh, that is uh, uh, in such an an environment, elite students become blind to their exclusive class privileges as well as the inequality embedded in the system. And specific, specifically, if the future or social economic elite believe that the poor or less educated masses are worse off due to innate uh, inferiority, inferiority, they are unlikely to take issue with increasing inequality around the world. They might also have limited motivation for designing and supporting effective policies for poverty relief, wealth redistribution or other reforms and at narrowing inequality in general. So this is a um, very strong critical uh, criticism of the study guard system that it is an autonomous, self-reproduced uh, educational inequality system that formatted in China. 
So uh, it also remind me, this not only happened in China, of course, it remind me the the tyranny of merit that's written by, by Michael Sandel that uh, uh, criticized the, uh, the meritocracy system in, in the United States. So this is the most uh, uh, beautiful part that I, I think that in, the, in almost in the end of the book that very beautiful and also very strong criticism of the uh, educational system in China. So um, uh, the, the, there are a little bit more implications right now, like uh, 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 Professor Stoto and Diana, in fact, you have mentioned about that, and also uh, uh, um, I think that we should also, from this book, um, that we also have a look to China's future um, about the new area. Uh, I think that uh, people, most of our observers of the um, of, uh, of China, uh, I, I believe that most of them agree that now Xi Jinping's area is the setback of economic reform. And uh, therefore, the uh, party state improved the importance of political loyalty rather than the educational achievements and the global connections. And uh, although the policies might reduce social inequality and economic growth together, I think that uh, especially after uh, the, the pandemic, we, I think that there will be an increasing tension between the study class meritocracy and the Xi Jinping's uh, absolute but not so meritocratic power. Um, uh, so I think that people have observed such kinds of uh, signals that people try to resistance or uh, at least show they disagree. <laughs> that, um, uh, 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 of uh, of uh, uh, Chinese either students or uh, uh, like some middle-aged um, um, uh, businessmen or women like me in my age, that I see that uh, they once of uh, uh, several uh, years ago talked about the evolution, uh, that is uh, Nei Juan. Um, um, some some. Translations say that use the uh, red race uh, uh, in in some in English, and uh, I think that it showed a reducing return of economic capital that return the the transition the market transition the trend of the market transition in the uh, stratification structure. So uh, now the entrepreneurs. Uh, feel that they they cannot so easy to earn money and also they feel that their efforts is not get a return as before. And uh, also there was another term called uh, uh, light down effect before uh, before the, the panel we have uh, talked about this <laughs> that uh, some uh, some translated to uh, lay down or lay flat. And there was some English uh, uh, documents, uh, essays say slapping out. Uh, I think that all of them is the same, almost the same meaning that people feel that there was lower uh, incentive for the owner of cultural or human capital owners. That uh, people don't think that they, they, they want to join the, the red race. This is, I, I think that this belong to, the two times in fact belong to two generations. The first one is belong to a generation, middle age generation, like entrepreneurs. And the second is mostly come from my graduate students <laughs> that now is in the school. So uh, uh, the third uh, 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 feeling or the um, phenomena that people call the political depression now is uh, spreading out uh, a lot of different generations. Uh, uh, especially for the liberal, liberal people have uh, some liberal attitudes in China. Um, I think that we should have uh, also um, notice on these new phenomena that how will these um, uh, kinds of uh, uh, social resistance will reflect, will reflect on the uh, 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 schools. 
on the field of schools that I don't know how the high school students uh, deal with these kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, spheres of the, of the area. So uh, I think that in the end, I will, I will say that Study Guide is an excellent book for scholars and uh, observers of China. A little bit look back before the outbreak, out, out, outbreak of the pandemic, but also look to the future that see how the tension of the meritocracy in the area of globalization, and uh, then after the pandemic, how will these kinds of tension uh, um, go on? So this is my comment. Also a little bit like a question to Yilin, <laughs> very similar to, to, to Anand. So uh, uh, I, I would like to stop here and I also, I will also put the book in the list of, the, of our, our seminars in Taiwan. Thank you. So thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lin Zhonghong. I think you bring out nice points how we can connect the finding of this book, how to connect it to the post-COVID China. And I'm also very curious with the rising uh, Sino-American rivalry is Harvard going to be the most deified uh, school among the new Shiazhen generation currently in China. I think a lot of to be discussed to confront the current reality of, of China. So now we have like uh, more than 20 minutes. So maybe, uh, and uh, the author, Dr. Yiling, uh, has already had a handful. So maybe you want to go with this question. And at the same time, I want to remind our audience that we have a Slido platform. So please feel free to type your question there. Uh, maybe uh, the author or our discussions may, 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 may answer the questions. So Yiling, maybe you go first. Great, right, thank you. Um... I gathered, I, I thought I would just um, start to respond uh, according to the sequence of the panelists. And so Dodo first asked about um, why academic success was the most important criterion for them, even though they could have easily chosen another pathway. I think this is related to their parental background. All of their parents achieved upward mobility into the elite through educational success. They. Um, <clears throat> they were the top 1% or 0.1% or even 0.01% in their populous provinces. They came to Beijing uh, by going to one of the top universities, oftentimes Tsinghua or Beida. Um, and then they also stayed in Beijing because they did well in school. And so I think for parents, this is a pretty good pathway that also is, um, use utilized traditionally in the traditional mindset as the education being the culture or the ladder to success in um, as hoping d uh, sort of talked about in the 60s um, another was the difference between political and economic elites that were both inside as you notice i pro i primarily look at the social economic elites who have top 10 percent income um, in china in 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 uh, urban China, so that would be about top 5% income in China as a whole. Um, they are pretty different from the political elites. Um, I don't really have any political elite, so-called, in the, in the sample, but I do hear about them. Omega is a high school that I interviewed students in. They are known for having children of political elites. Um, children in, and the students in capital did not like them at all. Um, capital students were more of the military elite. Um, they thought that the political elites were um, that they were absurd. They, they they said a lot of not so nice things about them. Um, I'm not sure how they knew about that, but I would suspect that also comes from hearsay or parental clashes that parents might have talked about. Um, things like that. On the other hand, um, Pinnacle is a, is a school that has political and economic elites and fewer military elites. They seem to not really care much about the political elites at all. Um, for example, is this is, I don't think this is in the book, but they actually, so during 2012 to 2014, there was a huge scandal of a uh, major in Sichuan province. Um, this mayor uh, without revealing too much, is related to Pinnacle. 
and they even list him as like an honorary alumni or something on the school right across the school gate on a huge billboard this person was thrown into jail and it was a huge scandal but they nonetheless decided to keep his name there showing i'm not sure what they're showing perhaps their political allegiance or that more likely that they simply do not care for what political backlash this might have towards the school in fact that school didn't even care that the political elites in Beijing one year later replaced their uh, their um, prince their school principal because the school principal didn't follow the center's the central's orders. Um, in that sense, the economic elites in the in this school in Pinnacle, uh, those parents gathered and raised voice to support the former principal, but in vain. They, they really couldn't do anything, but the fact that they thought that they were entitled enough to explain and to raise voices against the political elites who made this decision suggests that the economic elites are not always in line with them, and sometimes they are pretty serious uh, clashes between the two groups. Unfortunately, in these cases, the political elites won over and the, the, the president of the, the school principal of Pinnacle just never came back. Nobody knows where he is right now. Um, and the third question Dodo raised was how these students are innately superior or could still occupy center of attention overseas after high school. You are absolutely right that in the US or in the UK or even in France and Italy and Japan were places that they've gone. Academics don't really count that much. <laughs> it's really not that important. However, these students are overseas along with other Chinese students. And they are usually the largest group of international students in the receiving country. Um, in Britain, in Australia, in France, in America, Chinese students from mainland China are the biggest group. And oftentimes um, they do walk around together on campus. And so they also have a lot of activities. Um, the Alumni Association, Chinese Student Association. Um, they have multiple activities throughout the year that send, that builds their friendship and stays them close together. They are also assigned to live together by the school or they find each other and rent apartments or housing units outside of the school together. And so these students are really still, yes, they, 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 they changed their environment. They went to somewhere else for school, but they're still within the same ethnic enclave. So this probably taps into uh, Zhou Ming's uh, similar, uh, seg sim similar, segregated <laughs> assimilation, um, which is really very different from the idea that immigrants would you know, immediately adapt to mainstream American culture. Um, in fact, they carried their cultural and uh, ideas over with them. And by being within the enclave, they could still implement it among themselves. Of course, uh, I did notice that when they were interacting with other students, not from mainland China, they had a little different behavior, but still it was not exactly very different. They still judged each other and other non-Chinese citizens based on what they knew. And they were able to uphold that throughout four years of college, which was actually quite surprising for me as well. Um, turning attention to Angran's questions, um, I understand one of the questions was arrangements within the school that might have reinforced status competition in school. So um, that would be more like a school policy or educational policy sort of question. Um, I didn't really look at educational policy um, that in arrangements at the organization level, that would be Ling Lo's book, which he just published. It's called The Fruits of Opportunism. It is published by University of Chicago Press. Um, I'm waiting to get my hands on it. I have ordered it. Um, so he could probably talk more about it, but within this, this data that I looked at, um, schools reinforce status competition by the simple act uh, in two ways. By the simple act of, first of all, publicizing students' uh, academic outcomes. If they didn't publicize it, it wouldn't be a problem. But the fact that they chose to publicize it and not just only having large font prints of students' names who are top performers and their every single subject score on the school hallways, but also printing it in pink paper 
so everyone will see it on the white walls of the school. You could see it from not a mile away, but at least down the hallway that some, someone was, someone's name was there and everybody should have their attention there. And so this is an arrangement that the school does that actually reinforces such a competition. Another thing is that school give out performance pay for the teachers. So that, in fact, um, I know it is something uh, that is related to merit in a sense that performance pay means the better you do, the more pay you get, the more students you send to Tsinghua, Beida, or the Ivy Leagues, the higher the income you will get. However, um, this also has the unintended consequences that teachers might want to get those performance pay no matter what. Um, and that would reinforce the status competition among students. There is an example that I saw that Mrs. Mia, a homeroom teacher who studied, who, who taught Chinese language, insisted that she really needed an, an additional student who went to Tsinghua Beida. And she was asking other students who they thought among their classmates could do it. That is a lot of pressure <laughs> to the point where the, the homeroom teacher is asking the classmates to identify which could possibly be the eighth one. And we don't even know why she needs an eighth person out of 32. So I guess that would be a quarter of the students. Without eight, there would be less than a quarter. Maybe that would affect her performance pay. But um, we're not so sure why. The students all hesitated to ask. Being immersed in the field at the time, I felt like I almost, I also hesitated to ask. Thinking back, I should have. Um, another question I had was, what are the macro level changes that for elite reproduction? Of course, um, a lot of has happened in the past three years. There is COVID. Um, there is the uh, American-China trade war. There is the uh, a lot of uh, relationships are broken, ties are severed, and financial and economic relationships are damaged. In fact. Um, I think that to the, the, to the point that China, China, uh, US relationships are not that good. <laughs> um, China, America has decreased the number of student visas given to Chinese students. All of these students were very lucky that they went to school at least one, one year at the latest before the decrease in, in visa status. Um, However, the elite students didn't think that was a problem. They thought that even if you decrease the visa status, it would be the lower performing students who get cut off and not them. And so they are very entitled in that sense. I think that they would ultimately have to change as ties are no longer maintained and as um, American companies are forbidden to um, to to hire Chinese nationals. An example was not in this book, but it was the husband of a girl in the book that he was actually working in a lab um, and he studied something about information science and um, safety or internet safety like that. So he was working in a lab, but then because his lab uh, PI was Chinese, perhaps that's what they reasoned. The lab was closed down during the wave when the US government tried to shut down a lot of labs and force out a lot of Chinese scientists. He was among them. And so for uh, his wife, who never really cared about visa status, all of a sudden she cared deeply about these things. She thought she felt that it was unfair to her that government relationships were damaging or becoming a, a road bump, a bump to her status reproduction pathway. However, she also felt powerless. In fact, what can you do? Well, we, we can't really do anything. They're not the political elites. Even if they were, they were not as high ranked. And so the economic elites, unfortunately, who uh, try to reproduce their status through education must uh, adjust to these macro level changes. Um, COVID was another thing. Um, a lot of students had their dreams shattered because they could no longer stay outside. They were ordered to go back and schools were shut down. They didn't even have a proper graduation ceremony. They learned to adjust. Um, and I think if I were to do the study all over again, I would even add a fourth criteria which they need to learn, which is to adjust at all means. For, like with no matter what you do, adjust to the immediate situation immediately. And so that was something that was kind of interesting um, that happened after they had work in all of the different things that happen in macro society. Um, Le, with his two very difficult questions, 
Thank you. Um, one is the, about the Goffmanian idea of the impression management as ease. Of course, you immediately spotted that this is very Goffmanian. Um, I think it might also be related to cultural script. At least the gender norms that you identified is exactly on spot. Girls were harder working in general. There were a lot more study gods who were girls than boys. There were a lot of underachievers who were boys than girls. In fact, I don't think in this study there were more than two underachievers who were girls. All the underachievers essentially were boys. And um, the study holics were primarily girls. That is, I, I think there is definitely a cultural script that girls are told and expected to work harder than boys. Um, and also, overall, girls had higher status in school. That also reflects the educational advantage of, for females in Chinese society, especially in China uh, during the high school age. Um, and so I think that um, I might have affected the display of ease um, by I'm not so sure how, but if I think thinking back, um, boys probably wanted to demonstrate ease, particularly in front of a female ethnographer. They were, you know, quirky teenagers, <laughs> um, and they were trying to desperately to put on a show for all the females around them who are not teachers. Me being not a teacher would qualify, even though barely, in that group of the um, opposite, the gays of the opposite sex. And so that might have had an adverse uh, result. I hope not, at least. But then I can only take comfort in some of these underachievers, mothers or fathers saying that I was a uh, positive, <clears throat> positive, positive force that um, tried to get their, their children to study more. <laughs> at least I'm glad that that's what they think. Um, and as for a status, um, the hierarchy definitely reflects a particular group in this academic setting. This is very, very high performers. Um, um, a little bit of statistics or, um, uh, for, or numbers for the audience is that in China, less than 0.1% of the population can go to Tsinghua or Beida. It also depends on the, uh, on, the, on the province and city as well. But in Beijing, about 2% can go to Tsinghua or Beida. And within Pinnacle and Capital, 15 to 25% can go to these two schools. Within the classroom that I joined inside Pinnacle, over 50% of the students in that classroom would be going to Tsinghua or Beida. And so this is a hierarchy that reflects the top performers in Beijing city that are likely to succeed, or at least more likely than the average commoner in inside China. Um, other people who are musically or artistically talented students probably, and I think very likely would have a different idea of what, it, what constitutes status. But on the other hand, I'm sure that there are ways that we construct our hierarchies um, even though we're not exactly musically or artistically talented. Um, for example, I would imagine that the music students or in music school, their hierarchy might be related to the performance that they have in music. For example, um, if you had Lang Lang as a classmate who's doing tours around the world and there you have yourself like me who can't even do a tour inside the city, but we both study piano, then that would be a very different way in status. And in, in, in art, I would think it would be probably similar too. There are people who are acknowledged to be talented and others who are not. In fact, sometimes in music and art and even sports, um, I hear people talk about this even much more as innate ability. In sports, they talk, it's the body built you are born with. In art, it is some people are just, you know, like Picasso. They're born with a talent and in music, people, there's, there's Mozart who could start composing at three or four years old. Of course, I think all of this reflects certain social status and class-based privilege and positions. For athletes, you need to train, you need to know how to diet, like how to eat, what to drink. Um, and for music, there is the popular idea that uh, Randall Collins often said that you would, be mu you would be Mozart if you were born in that situation. I don't think so, but a lot, of, but that is a one popular opinion. Um, and also for art too, um, we don't really know. Art, arts, artistic students don't usually have artistic parents. 
as prominently as academics that we see. And so I think they will have a different status hierarchy, uh, but I think the guidelines might be pretty similar. Um, and all of that boils down to how advantage by class is actually uh, hidden behind the backgrounds, even for these students who are not competing in the academic setting. Um, Dong Hong talked about uh, merit. Thank you for focusing on it. Um, and also, he was interested in how high school students dealt with politics, nature, and Tangping, or political depression. Um, this is pretty interesting because these high school students were so far from Neijun or Tangping at the time that I have never heard these two words during field work. It is one, uh, it is one possibility that these words were not created before 2014 or at least not popular among high school students. But then also uh, these students were high school students at the time. They can't afford to Neijun or Tangping when they have parents, teachers, peers, all on all looking over their shoulders on their backs forcing them and making everything publicized uh public to uh to for to, to try to get them to compete for whatever glory the school thinks that it would get based on the academic outcomes of these students and so they if i think if they wanted to compete they would probably have to do it afterwards but um as i see in high school in, in college they didn't really do that either. They were still desperately fighting for uh, status or recognition um, in the society that they were in. And so um, the final thing was with politics. It was, this is probably due to my, my status as a Taiwanese who is from an American institution. Um, none of the students talked to me about politics. Um, not even the teachers and for sure not the parents. In fact, the parents were even quite wary of me because I because of my uh, background in these two places. Um, the, it, the, the parents who, had, who allowed me to go there to, into their house sometimes asked that I don't tell other people who he or she was. Of course I wouldn't, but they were just trying to make very clear that I would not do anything to harm their career or their children. Even in interviews, some parents refused to give interviews uh, for fear that I would ask anything that was politically itchy. Um, instead, I had I, I definitely had to stay within education, and that is when some of them would open up to know that I was really only focused on family and education and student life. And so that is something that um, is related to the ethnographer's background, but I'm glad that but without talking about politics, my research is not censored or uh, you know, suspicious in any way possible. Um, and I hope that the students and families who accepted me and even the schools would not be in trouble for being in contact with me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yiling. Um, do we have a question from our audience? I saw one question listed in our Slido. Uh, Yiling, can you read that? Or maybe sure. our, our discussion might be coming for the second round comment and further discussion. With eating. The question is, are there similarities and differences between the hierarchy of school status systems in China and Taiwan based on my observation? Um, I actually did not observe Taiwanese high schools in the same year, but I went to high school 10 years before these students. It was pretty similar. So <laughs> right now, I'm not so sure because Taiwanese education reform has been going towards a more American way of recognizing talent. Um, and so I think it would be slightly different. Um, but then even in America, ease is very important. It's just not as golf manian and strategic. And so I think we would probably move towards that way a little bit. Thank you. So any question or I just uh, because the question is about Taiwan, I my final thought is that Actually, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Taiwan, we have an election coming up next week. And throughout the past week, we have uh, our conversation has been centered around an ex person in Taiwan who can himself is kind of who believe herself to have kind of an innate superiority so that he, she can do anything she wants. And he's so much in the conversation. Um, I, I don't think I have to mention the name, but everyone knows who I'm speaking about. So maybe. Eating can further study when she and become politician and how is the social reception of this person? I think 
that would be a further research topic for eating. It's just my my very irresponsible uh, suggestion for an a, a otherwise very young and bright career for an early stage sociologist like eating. So maybe we'll end our uh, lunch today here. And thank you all for participation. I have been enjoying the very lively conversation. I hope that we next time our research institute can have this kind of event in the future. So thank you all for coming here today. So I see you around. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye bye.